Welcome everyone. Uh, we have about 20 people in the hall here in East End, Saskatchewan, and I have perhaps up to 100 folks uh, tuning in virtually. This is the first and maybe the last time I ever do a meeting like this. My name is Lauren Scott. I'm the chair of uh, SODCAP, South of the Divide Conservation Action Program, and welcome to our annual general meeting. First of all, we'd like to thank Alice Canada, Alternative Land Use um, Group here in Canada for sponsoring this annual meeting. Can you guys hear me at the back at all? <laughs> I'll rent you my hearing aids. Just got some folks moving up closer. No, I will not do that. I hard. Thank you to uh, Caitlin from uh, PCAP for looking after the uh, audiovisual stuff today. Um, a first order of business is uh, the first call for resolutions. And uh, if anybody has any resolutions, uh, see Tom up here. And I guess that's it for that. I'm just gonna oh. read that one out. Oh, okay. We have one resolution here. Be it resolved that SODCAP amend bylaw 5.1 to read number of directors. Until changed in accordance with the act, the board shall consist of not less than five, not more than 13 directors. Be it further resolved that SODCAP change any and all related bylaws that may conflict or prevent the proposed amendment. This includes, but may not be limited to section 5.2 board composition and 9.2 membership class. The number of board members will increase from 10 to 13 if approved. Do you want to comment on that? Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're looking to to increase the board membership to include uh, some more reps uh, to uh, cover uh, the pasture pasture groups, uh, a youth position, and a First Nations position. Um, so I guess I'm looking for uh, a mover. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking for a, a mover and a seconder here. So right now. Right now. Okay, Keith Day moves. Seconder, Don Connick. Uh, further discussion. Further discussion on this? Vote. Okay, it looks like there's none. Can we have a, a vote? Uh, all in favor, hands up. Uh, looks like we've got it. Kay, uh, Caitlin online, and we have uh, people voting. Um, one second here, I'm just checking. Um, yes, one person says I. <laughs> um, if any of your listeners on the phone, feel free to raise your hand or just type into the chat box. Oh, maybe you can bring the hand. And there's no hands up. <laughs> Where is your computer speaker? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> it just comes out the side. I think it just comes out the side. I like this. You guys hanging around me. Yeah, it's I on the ball. Is... <laughs> okay. Can we tilt it up? Can I lift it on a book? Okay, 
Okay, what, so this, what is it that I need to do? I can't hear her. Okay. Can you hear us now, Caitlin? Yes, I can. Everything's loud and clear. Okay, that motion was carried to uh, increase the number of directors from a uh, maximum of 10 to up to 13. Thank you for doing that. Next item is, uh, I guess, a message from myself as chair. And uh, we normally have two chairs, but Orrin Bayless uh, uh, stepped down uh, halfway through the past year, and we will go back to having a co chairs. So um, I guess that's my first year as chair, and uh, sorry, I have to read this, and there's a similar report in the annual report as well. After several years of planning by the federal and provincial governments, producers, and other organizations, the South of the Divide Conservation Action Program was formed in 2014. The sod area refers to the area in southwest Saskatchewan located in the Milk River drainage basin. The designers of SODCAP decided that a non-profit agency funded by governments, industry, conservation interests, producer organizations, and others with a vested interest in the SOD area was the best way to achieve their object objectives, which mainly focused on species at risk conservation. SODCAP was, has worked very efficiently. We have no office, low overhead, Rather, staff and contractors work from home and on the ground with landowners. Today, we, in this short time we've been around, we've secured over 250,000 acres of native grasslands, enrolled in one of several SODCAP programs, and these partnerships include a variety of programming types. Results-based conservation agreements, habitat management agreements, habitat restoration, grass banking, niche product marketing, and promoting beneficial management practices for habitat and native uh, prairie. All of these programs are to benefit producers as well as our native flora and fauna. SODCAP has proven to be very successful, flexible, and user-friendly partnership with producers. Landowner support and cooperate. cooperation is key to our success. Producers who have managed grasslands for generations know how to best achieve livestock grazing and biodiversity values. The sod cap area, the sod area contains up to a dozen species at risk. Conservation of our natural heritage is the responsibility of governments at all levels, as well as society at all levels who represent the interests of Canadians. Thank you for your continued interest and support for SODCAP. We must ensure that the success of our programs with producers continues to ensure that our precious natural native grasslands and the species dependent upon them can coexist with sustainable livestock grazing as they have for the past 150 years. A special thanks to our funders, our staff, and the producers for your dedicated support and cooperation. Respectively submitted, Lauren Scott. If anybody has any questions or advice, by all means raise them or see me later, whatever. Well, we're already ahead of schedule. I guess I don't know whether I've said much about myself. I am a conservationist representing Nature Saskatchewan on the board, one of the conservation groups. I uh, live and farm at Indian Head, uh, ban birds, take photographs, uh, put a conservation easement on my land to preserve the native aspen and wetlands. And uh, also, don't hold this against me, but was a minister, uh, member of the legislature in the 1990s and served as Minister of Environment. Thank you. I'm not interrupting. No. Okay. 
Perfect. And I also sent all the attendees. It looks like we have um, about 30 people on the line and I sent everyone a handout through the webinar. Um, yeah, it says handouts three out of five. So there's also the annual report located there. I think you're good. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll call the business uh, meeting to order and we'll start with uh, Tom, our executive director's uh, annual report. Okay, well, thanks very much, Lauren. Um, I, I guess before uh, you know, we begin. I'm I'm going to present the annual report, and uh, I will, first of all, I want to thank Krista because she just finished up the the drafting of it. I think it was about 2:30 last night. So, uh, anyway, and before that, I want to thank Alice Canada for uh, sponsoring the this uh, annual general meeting. Alice became a, a partner this fiscal year, and so. Uh, wasn't involved last year, but it's a new new collaboration that we just started up, and I'd like again to thank them. Uh, they, they've been uh, uh, very supportive of us. I'd also like to take this time to to uh, thank Warren Bayless. Uh, I I know uh, Lauren already mentioned this, but Warren was extremely active in the development of the the, the multi species at risk action plan. Uh, you know, dating back to the late 2000s. And uh, you know, sat as a board chair since the inception of, of SODCAP, and he stepped away here this this last year. And so, I just want to take this this time to to thank him for doing that. I uh, also want to thank the staff of uh, of SODCAP. They are the they are the guys that that make this program work. And my job is just to get out of their way. Uh, also, want to thank the producers and, and and the collaborators that we work with. We have we have numbers of, of, of projects and on the go right now with, and, and we need those cooperating producers to, to make this a, a successful operation. So, uh, so if, you, if you look back to the annual report, you know, and what we're talking about here is the, uh, the, the fiscal year of 2019 to March 31st of, of 2020. So we're going back to there. Well, what the biggest things that we saw in that in that uh, fiscal year was we wrapped up a, a couple multi-year programs, the SARPEL program, which was funded through uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the funding flew flowed to uh, the Saskatchewan stock growers, and and we were contracted as a delivery agent. The other the other program was a three-year program. Uh, which was the habitat stewardship program, looking at habitat management agreements on on critical habitat for greater sage grouse, and both those programs wrapped up last year. Uh, and and between those programs and some funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and some other project money, uh, what we were able to achieve was probably 40 plus agreements with you know or conservation agreements with with producers. Uh, and and had an impact on about 250,000 acres of, of native grasslands and critical habitat in southwest Saskatchewan. Uh, we we did some evaluations of these programs uh, through third-party independents funded by groups like MyTax and Libre Arrow. Uh, we we had uh, postdoc fellowships working on those, and and from a social economic standpoint. Uh, we found that these programs and, and conservation agreements that we, we signed were very, very well received. Uh, the producer uptake or producer acceptance of these producers of these of agreements were really well accepted. Uh, I think that the biggest thing was that the, that we tailored uh, these projects to be to fit the, the niches of, of the producers, and and the programs were de developed from a grassroots perspective so it was from a bottom up and if you if you think back five six years ago you know our conversations with producers is was how do you make these programs work 
and, and, and ensure that we have uptake at the grassroots level. And, and that's the way we designed these programs. And so now when we did the evaluations, we saw a very high producer acceptance of, of them. Uh, the other thing that we, we came out in these in these programs is that we had a very high level of trust with the delivery agencies, and and that speaks to the staff. It speaks to uh, you know the people that work for us. And, and I'll mention Kelly Williamson, uh, Krista Connick, Todd, Diego Steinacher, Mel Ratter, uh, or Toppy. I keep forgetting who the, what her last name is. Uh, but those are the people that are in the on the field, meeting day to day with the producers, meeting day to day with uh uh you know the the guys involved in projects you know we brought guys like lee sexton down to 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 do that goat grazing and and it takes time and effort to to make sure that these that, that air, all the wheels are in motion that the extension the engagement with producers ongoing the monitoring of the habitats ongoing and then the, the extension the communication is, is ongoing as well too so uh, and, and the other thing that came out of the evaluations was that the incentives uh, were, were appreciated. They weren't the top thing that, that drove people getting into conservation agreements, but they had to be appropriate enough to, to encourage people to get involved. So three things, you know, you know high producer acceptance, trust in, a, in, in the delivery agency and, and, and uh, incentives. So uh, we also did some economic analysis of our programs and it, it on the types of agreements we, we are able to look at like if you look at agreement like a habitat management agreement uh, it's kind of prescriptive we know the cost we know the time and effort put in and we can assign dollars we, we were able to determine that you know what the appropriate cost is uh habitat restoration we know that's running between four or five hundred dollars an acre to get land into grass using native species one of the biggest questions we had, though, was with the, the results-based conservation agreements. It was basically a non-prescriptive agreement, and 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 we're just in the in the final stages or putting the final touches on that report. But I can I can tell you that when when you look at this, uh, we're looking at about a six to seven dollar an acre uh, cost for environmental management. To achieve environmental outcomes such as habitat targets for greater sage growth and and sprigs pipit and that's based on a number of things it's based on uh we did surveys of the guys that were involved with them and asked them you know what is it taking to to achieve these type of outcomes and 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 so the calculation was based on things like you know uh how much time do you actually spend planning and thinking about how you're going to manage for environmental benefits, and that's mean that's over over and above the, the normal cost of production of your livestock. Uh, so what came back was on average it was over 200 hours a, a year, 203 I think was was the final. The other thing is like how much time do you actually spend on on being uh, engaged? Uh, do you go to workshops? Do you sit on committees? Sorry, Tom, um, this is Caitlin here. We can't seem to hear you. Sorry we just that. lost audio all of a sudden. Oh, I don't know how to change that. Oh, I've got Krista coming. Oh, Jeff is, says. Is it working now? You can hear it on his end. So I actually, I think it's just me. Sorry, I'll let you continue. Everyone else is okay, just me. You go ahead. <laughs> you want me to keep talking? Yeah, okay. So, anyways, um, that came that that result came in at about 213 hours. Um, so like that's in time contribution from producers to do to provide environmental services. We can calculate that. The other things that we came up with was uh, hardcore investment into infrastructure, you know, things like plants, water, uh, whatever else that was out there. Uh, we're also looking at, at lost opportunities, not not opportunities to break up the grasslands, but other things, things like uh, uh, guys guys used uh, tame pastures for early spring grazing where it could have been uh, annually cropped or used for green feed 
or something like that. And, and that actually uh, presented a lost opportunity. Uh, we also looked at, uh, you know, other costs, uh, you know, things like uh, additional trucking costs, uh, you know, additional movement with, with horses, additional movement with dogs, things like that, where you actually had to pay more attention. So uh, when you all told and said, and you average this up, uh, put a dollar figure to it and divided by the number of acres that were under these results-based agreements, what was coming up, I think it was in that 673 per acre. So, and, and these guys are getting paid out about three and a half dollars an acre. So these guys are, are actually contributing over and above what we're paying them, you know, if we if our calculations, you know, hold true. So I think it's, it's important that we realize that the economic analysis has been done on this, and uh, and, and you know we can debate that one way or another. So um, I want to point out some of the the key projects that we did work on this year. Uh, we have contracts with the Beaver Valley and Belmarie. Uh, uh, Grazing corporations uh, on a results base. We're going into our, we're in our second, we're going into our third year right now with them you know, on 25,000 25, acres of, of greater sage rose critical habitat. And uh, 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 Diego and Mel and, and Kelly, I believe, have been out there and I think they finished up all the assessments for this year. And I don't know what the results were. I don't know. Were they all good? Oh, Diego, Diego just put thumbs up, said they all met their targets at, at their project site. So he's all excited about that. Uh, another project that we, we did highlight in the, in the annual report was the Raptor 7 uh, project, which was a uh, sort of a habitat management agreement with uh, uh, Tim Christensen. Uh, from Valmarie and he, he ranches near the Grasslands National Park and he, he has a, a, a significant amount of critical habitat for greater sage grouse. And what he implemented was a, a long-term uh, uh, rotational grazing system. So, uh, the other things that you know, I wanted to point out, if you, if you look through this, there's been a lot of interest in, in branding and marketing and one of the things that, that we worked on in, in conjunction with the Saskatchewan stock growers was uh, a survey of consumers. We know we know we can produce environmental outcomes. Uh, there's an interest in doing that. Now, is there a consumer willingness to, to pay for this? And so we did a, 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 a survey spot run by Incitrix. And, and what what came out of that is, is well, it was, you know, obvious, but I mean, price and quality of, of product is, is top of mind, but there's a significant portion of the population that is willing to pay for uh, beef or specialty products produced in an environmentally friendly way and such as being sourced from, from uh, native grasslands or sourced from uh, you know, critical habitat for species risk. So it's very, very important that we realize that. And, and I think there's a desire from some producers to tap into that market. So a couple of the agreements that we did do, uh, you know, did exactly that. And one of the producers that we did work with produced a video. We produced a video with them to highlight their, work, their, their operation to help them uh, market they're uh, kind of a brand of beef uh, we have a brand uh, it's called prairie provides we can put that on there uh, and i think this kind of branding and marketing needs to be explored more uh you know by producers and in you know and, and there's a uh, uh a movement out there uh that is kind of supporting what we call bird friendly coalition and, and it's made up of a number of different uh, groups and we're a part of that right now. So uh, a very, I think it's a very important thing to do. So anyways, uh, moving forward into to new programming this coming year and down the road, uh, there is gonna be a next iteration of SARPAL. It's not gonna be last time, it was like about $2.6 million over five years. 
It's not going to be that same amount of money. Uh, and it's going to be more focused, I believe. Uh, I think the Environment and Climate Change Canada would like to see us work more on uh, private lands and work more on securement and, and uh, uh, target greater sage grouse critical habitat as opposed to you know native grasslands in general. And so that's that's kind of the direction the SARPEL program is being uh, pushed towards. Uh, so we're, we're if we're going to work on native grasslands in a in a you know in general and critical habitat for other species, I think we're going to probably have to secure other funding. And uh, you know, Alice is one group that we've actually secured funding from to do that kind of work, and uh, we've already initiated the funding for that for uh, restoration projects on on that one so uh some other groups that are coming on board back on board sas power is, is back on board providing some educational money and and uh, that will be going forward so we've got some irons in the fire as far as teacher funding and and i think that's important um uh, i just before I, I wrap this thing up i just want to comment on on some of our extension and, and communication activities that we've done. In, and, you know, it's it's one thing we spend lots and lots of time working with producers and working on projects and, and achieving that. But we also do do a lot of uh, extension, like public awareness type extension. And uh, just there's a, a list of about a half a dozen or so items here in, in the annual report. And just to touch on a couple of them. Uh, we were, we were extremely involved in the transboundary grassland workshop, which was hosted in Regina this last year, and that that brings together uh, you know partners from uh, Alberta, Montana, and Saskatchewan. Uh, it also uh, was cool work with uh, the Native Prairie and, uh, and Restoration Workshop, which was usually led by the the PCAP people. Um, this last year, we actually, one of the things that was, was um, suggested by our board was to, to bring more First Nation engagement in. And, and that's been done a couple of years ago. So what we've done this last year is we actually had some range health and plant identification work days at the Nikani First Nations up by Maple Creek there. Uh, and, and we did uh, go in and work with the, the healing lodge there. We, we did a couple of workshops with them and, and brought their residents out into the field, uh, worked with uh, one of their staff at the, at the Healing Lodge and, and presenting that. So that was that was very good. It was interesting, eye-opening for me. Um, we've done invasive species workshops for rural municipalities. Um, we've done multi-species management conservation planning at East End in conjunction with PCAP, I believe. Uh, some of the bigger presentations that we did was uh, presented at the Sustainability, Sustainability of Canadian Agriculture Farming for Solutions Conference in Saskatoon, and that was just before COVID shut everything down. Uh, we actually, Kelly and I traveled to Billings, Montana and presented at the National Fish and Wildlife Fund Grantee Workshop, and uh, we're, we're very well received down in there. Uh, we're, we're publishing papers. Uh, we've got a strong social media uh, program. Uh, Melanie has been instrumental in, in putting out social media tweets and Facebooks and whatever all that stuff is. So it's all good stuff. So anyway, I think that's important. One of the things we really have to stress is that we have to increase the awareness of what we're doing, not just in, in the farming community, but also in, in the general public. So I think that's where we where where we haven't done a lot of work, but I think that's some place that I think we need to work too. So I'm going to wrap that up. What I would do is this is a, a long document. Uh, if you haven't, take a read through it. Everybody has access to it. It'll be on our website if if you if you don't have it right now. Uh, and if you have any questions whatsoever, please contact us. I think Krista threw up the names and contact information of. Uh, of myself and Lauren and all the staff so any one of us can probably answer those questions so I'll just I'll wrap it up there and I'll turn it back over to uh, Lauren here 
And, uh, and then I'm going to ask, uh, we're, we're going to do a call for, am I doing a call now? Are we doing the call for nominations now? Yes, Jeff. Okay, so I'll, I'll get, could, Caitlin, can you unmute Jeff? And, and I'll let him speak to that. Yes, Jeff is unmuted. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, thanks. So, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, yeah, first call for nominations was issued with the announcement of the SODCAP annual general meeting. Um, I am co-chairing the nominations committee with uh, Ad McPherson from the Stock Growers Association. Um, scrutineers for the, the voting, should any be required, um, are uh, Caitlin Rose online, uh, Allison Ziegler and Diego Steinecker will take care of the physical balloting in East End. And for folks who are only able to uh, get on by phone, they can text me their vote at 306-787-7196. So in accordance with the recently amended bylaws, um, we, we are, uh, Voting or or the board consists of uh, representatives from two agricultural non-government organizations, two environmental non-government organizations, two industry corporations active in the in the region. We have one representative from municipal government, one member at large representing local landowners, and we now have one grazing corporation representative, one First Nations representative, and one young producer from the region. Each of the directors serves a two-year term and it alternates so that we're not replacing the entire board every two years. Um, terms that expire this year include uh, Keith Day, from the Cattlemen's Association, uh, Larry Grant, member at large, and Chad Macy from the industry section. On behalf of the, the nominations committee, I'm happy to report that the response to first call for nominations resulted in uh, the following persons being nominated for board of director positions. Uh, they should be up on the overhead screen. Um, I jump no, back? not yet. Um, okay. Well, we'll, we'll. If you say it, yeah, I have to launch it. Sorry. <laughs> if you okay. tell me out loud, I will create it. <laughs> or okay. maybe, maybe Chris has got it on her end, and Tom. What What do you need on the screen, Jeff? Just the uh, the names of the the candidates that have been nominated so far. We did the first call for resolutions, but not for nominations yet. Yeah. Okay. So um, from the agricultural non-government organizations, Keith Day from the Cattlemen's Association has agreed to let his name stand. Um, from the environmental uh, non-government organizations. Gord Vadlin from Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society and Mike Burak from Nature Conservancy of Canada have agreed to let their names stand. Um, from industry, Jennifer Barker at TransCanada Energy has agreed to let her name stand. And for members at large, Larry Grant has agreed to let his name stand for re-election. We've also had uh, Dale Mosquito from the Nekanit First Nation uh, agree to stand for the 
inaugural term of our First Nations board member. Um, Clint Christensen has agreed to stand for uh, community pasture representation. And Shay Anderson has agreed to let his name stand as a young producer uh, for, for the upcoming term. So um, we have the last three positions to fill. And we also have four uh, uh, positions from the from the existing board left to fill. So seven positions in total. And so I would at this time call for any nominations from the floor. Kate, Caitlin, you'll let me know if anything shows up. Yes. Um, I was. There's also a question about who is allowed to vote. Would you be able to elaborate on that? We uh, believe we agree that anybody that is uh, present in person or virtually at the time of the call for votes is eligible to vote. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. And I don't have any nominations on the webinar. Any from the floor, Lauren? No indication from any no indication from anyone uh, uh, being nominated from the floor. Okay. Um, did we want to proceed with some of the other business and come back to this, or do you want to wrap this up right now? I think while we're on it, let's uh, wrap it up now. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, Keith Gay, Jennifer Barker, Larry Grant, Dale Mosquito, Clint Christensen, and Shay Anderson have all been elected by acclamation. And that leaves us with vote between Gord Vadlin and Mike Burak uh, for one of the environmental NGO positions. And I would ask Mike to uh, briefly introduce himself and, and uh, tell us about uh, why he wants to be on the board. And then I'll allow Gord the same opportunity. Mike, Gordon. Gordon or Mike, are you online? They, they look muted. Um, yes, the oh, actually, each one is muted themselves, so I can't unmute. But Gord okay. or Mike, if you can hear us, maybe you can unmute and introduce yourself. No sign of him, Caitlin. Oh, hi, it's uh, Gord here. No, um, uh, yeah, so sorry, I, I originally had a message that I was muted by the organizer and I, I was not able to unmute. So, um, but uh, it that's changed now. So, um, but uh, uh, I know uh, Mike was given the opportunity to go first, so I don't want to just um, step in and uh, take his spot if he's ready to go as well. He looks like he's still muted. Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, 
So my name is Mike Barrett. I'm the program director for Southwest Saskatchewan with the Nature Conservancy of Canada here. Um, so for for entity purposes, the Southwest sub region is basically the mixed grassland eco region as well as the Cypress upland eco region. Um, so I've been in this position for about three three and a bit years now, uh, and in total, I've been with NCC for just over five years. Um, so I guess a bit about my position with NCC and how it kind of fits in with, with all of this here. Um, my role is to lead our securement projects. So any new land acquisitions uh, that we undertake in that area. So in the, the Milk River Basin in particular um, are, are handled by myself, first of all, uh, and then are passed on to some of our stewardship staff who report to me directly after that. Um, and then once that happens, I still oversee all the stewardship of those fee simple lands. So currently in the Milk River Basin, we have three properties. Old Man on its back is probably familiar to most people, um, as well as our wide view property, which is uh, 3,000 acres just outside of Grasslands National Park. And then we recently, last fall, added three more quarters uh, southwest of Consul to our portfolio as well. And then we have another project that's kind of uh, a bit too early stages to really talk about too much, but it could be. I think it's five quarters that we'll, we'll be adding in that same kind of console area again. Um, so we have about, in addition to the lands, we have about 55 conservation easements um, in the Milk River Basin in general, and then a whole bunch up in Cypress as well. So that is, is another part of, of my job is both signing new conservation easement agreements, as well as um, helping the staff that are on the ground to actually manage those and do all the compliance monitoring and things like that. Um, and then on top of that, also responsible for the financial side of all of that work and activities. So the annual budgeting, work planning, proposal writing, fundraising, um, some donor relations as well. Um, I was actually previously on the SODCAP board briefly. Uh, so NCC has been uh, part of the board, I think, since the, the group kind of started. Uh, and we decided at the end of, I think it was 2018, that we would take a step and see if other environmental groups wanted to kind of uh, sit on the board for a bit of a change and then we were asked to to rejoin here now that there is an extra seat that's opening up for ENGOs so we thought uh, stepping away from the board we found we were a little bit more out of touch than we expected we would be with kind of the goings on in different groups that are working in the area so uh, when we were approached we thought it would be a good a good way to get us back in touch with a lot of what's going on the ground uh, in this general area so that would be Kind of what we're, we're hoping to get out of this again by uh, by coming back to the board. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, Gord, you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, do you want me to turn my camera on, Lauren? Or does it matter? I think, I think you're on. in case anybody wants to see what I look like. Uh, it's not. Not not the best looking fellow, but um, so yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, when Lauren and um, Chad reached out to me originally with the idea, um, I, had, I I also had some questions and uh, agreed to let my name stand. Um, my name is Gord Vaudlin. I'm the executive director for the Saskatchewan chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. I currently reside in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I recently. Um, Recently retired from ranching myself. My family still ranches uh, in the Big River area, southwest corner of Prince Albert National Park, about 300 uh, cow-calf pairs there. And um, I used to also run a tourism company in that same neck of the woods, taking people out on, on horseback um, to view uh, wildlife, wild bison, and that sort of thing. And so um, that's uh, you know, backcountry trips and that sort of thing. Um, that's also kind of where I got my start in conservation. There is a wild herd of, of bison there, and um, I was a founder of an organization called the Sturgeon River Plains Bison Stewards, which was essentially a, a rancher-led organization that um, focused on on the uh, dealing with the issues uh, related to having a wild bison herd in the area, while also uh, doing that through the lens of uh, of conserving the herd and making sure that it uh, remained viable. So um, that's where I developed my belief that there's a strong uh, relationship and strong potential um, on um, on rancher-led initiatives for conservation, and um, you know it's really definitely how I cut my teeth. Uh, my work my work now with uh, CPAWS really focuses on on um, 
on collaboration and, and collaborative approaches to conservation. I, my work is sort of across the province of a lot of a lot of work in the boreal with in the boreal forest with caribou and those sorts of things and and uh, a real strong focus these days with CPAWS on um, on building relationships with indigenous partners and uh, First Nations and Métis partners as as a as a big um, an important role in of uh, any sort of conservation initiative going forward. So so yeah, a, a real uh, a real strong uh, background in um, in. Uh, you know, uh, working with ranchers and 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 with indigenous communities, um, a real focus on collaboration and um, and CPAWS as an organization. We've been around since well since uh, '65, I believe, 1965. So, um, uh, uh, organization like NCC with a long history and um, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, also, we work very well with NCC. In fact, uh, Jen McKillop and I were just up in Cumberland House. Um, just got back uh, late last night. So, so yeah, it's a it's a it's an honor to uh, be considered and to um, have the opportunity to, to present uh, this to you folks. And um, happy with the decision either way. Um, and um, looking forward to hopefully hopefully working with you, no matter. Um, no matter how the vote goes down here, um, CPAWS is always available and, and interested in, in what's happening south of the divide with, uh, with the species at risk. Oh, and a couple more things I wanted to mention. Um, I do sit on the federal committee, um, the uh, priority the priority sector committee for the agriculture sector for uh, the species at risk work. I sit on the working group for that. Also on the provincial habitat advisory committee. That's uh, been struck by the Minister of Environment. I'm a part of that, and I've also been added to the working group for the Mid-Continental Flyway, which will be looking at um, looking at uh, transboundary grassland and flyway issues from uh, from northern Saskatchewan all the way through the prairies, down through the states, and down into Mexico. So um, something that's being um, developed just now and just sort of underway. And I've been asked to be a part of that working group as well. So. So, like I said, a collaborative approach, and always looking to work with partners and expand expand uh, those partnerships wherever possible. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. Um, so, at this time, I guess I would make the uh, final uh, final call for nominations. Is uh, anything from the floor? Lauren? Anybody? No. <laughs> okay. Nothing on nothing <clears throat> online, Caitlin? Nope, nothing online. All right. I would uh, ask for somebody to uh, move to close nominations. Larry Grant. Thanks, Larry. Uh, second. Sharon. Okay. Uh, so we have have a vote, as I said, between uh, Mike and Gord. Um, folks online should see the uh the quick poll that uh caitlin has set up um if you could vote there um allison diego you guys uh have paper i hope and um can collect ballots from people who are present physically in east end and anybody that can only call in on the phone is free to as i said text me 306 787 7196 um what do we need five ten minutes to to vote and collate the, the numbers 15 Yeah, ten is probably good. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah, no. I can. So, can we say quarter after five? Sure.
quarter after five then uh, Jeff uh, they're counting them and uh, we'll cover some other stuff in the meantime sounds good and thanks very much for doing a good job of that along with Chad uh, yeah it's, uh, props to Chad so I think uh, we'll move on to the uh, minutes of the uh, last annual meeting they're in the package I'm sure everybody's read them word for word, but um, would somebody move the adoption of the minutes from the last meeting? Jeff, uh, maybe I can check. Is anybody taking minutes? No. Oh. Yeah, Melanie, are, are you taking minutes? Okay, good. Thank you. Somebody thought you were, but. Uh, Okay, uh, Jeff has moved the seconder to accept the minutes from the last AGM. Uh, the guy that has the same shirt as me. Jeff? Keith? Lee. Lee. Lee, okay. Thank you, uh, Lee. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor of uh, accepting the minutes? Raise your hands. Opposed? Uh, they are carried. Good. Thank you. Uh, she's busy now. Um, are you good? Most important person here. She looks out for the money. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Caitlin. Yes. Um, right now, what's showing on the screen is still the voting. Okay. Can you show our? Oh, do you want to your show, screen? Do you want to? Yeah. So I think want, um, I can close the voting. I think everyone's had a chance to vote online. Um, and I will send you a window and you'll want to click show my screen or show my um, I, ha I have to close the poll it looks like actually there and we can see your webcam now I don't know who's read when that one is. <laughs> there we go. Are we good to go? We're good to go. So my name is Allison Bigger. Um, I work with SODCAP. I am a chartered professional accountant uh, with my own business here in East End, uh, Horizon Business Solutions. I got involved with SODCAP quite a few years ago now um, from a board member that was on the board at the time, uh, wanted some support services on the financial side. And um, I was nervous because I didn't have a lot of environmental experience. I'll be honest, none. <laughs> and, uh, but when it comes to the numbers, that's my forte. So um, I've learned a lot in the time that I've been with SODCAP and I'm really enjoying being on here. So um, I'll try not to bore those of you that aren't that interested in this, but uh, in the end, it all kind of comes down to the numbers a lot of times. So. Uh, 
and then to round along a little bit about them. Um, our year ended March 31st, um, so I'll just go through a few highlights. Everybody should have the financial statements that come with the AGM package. Uh, they were a separate um, attachment, so um, you can have those in front of you because you have them or have access to them. I'm not necessarily going to put them right up on the screen to view. I created these uh, funding and expenditure graphs because I feel like it provides a little bit better of a presentation of where the money goes and uh, where the focus of the, the financials are. Uh, if you're looking at kind of the first pages, you are looking at um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you want me to post them on your screen there? Whichever. Um, I'm going to flip back and forth. So I'll just mention, yeah, I can mention when I want the funding graph up if you want, Caitlin. Um, just if you want me to put the screen up there, like put it up on your screen. To put the what? Sorry, did you want me to put your report on the screen there? Like we, I don't think we can see it on our end here on mine. Can you see the funding graph on your screen right now? No, I don't have it. Um, maybe some other webinar participants can type in, but yeah, I don't see it yet. Yeah, you can see it on the screen. And is it the... It's just a circle graph. Can you see that? I'll send it I'll back send to you. Back. Um, you'll see a box that'll pop up and you'll want to click show my screen or show my window and hopefully that works. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Got it. Sorry about that. Okay, so if you go to page, it's actually page four of the financial statements, but on the bottom page of the financial statements, it shows us page one. And that's just the statement of financial position. It's the balance sheet uh, with the assets and liabilities of podcast. So like I mentioned before, March 31st, 2020 was um, the year end. So that's what this report is up to. Uh, the cash balance sitting at 145,740. Everybody can kind of read through, look at it. What stands out, um, I think for me, uh, when looking at this is just, is there enough assets to cover the liabilities that we're showing at the end of the year? Um, and there is. Uh, there's ratios that we do kind of to look at that and um, just make sure that at the end of the year, we're going to be able to pay all the bills that uh, we've got enough cash flow for that. Um, so it's a strong balance sheet, I think. Uh, there's always room for growth. There's always room for things to be better. But uh, in the end, it ended okay. A uh, couple things I just wanted to point out. Prepaid expenses is just related to some of our insurance costs. Uh, that's pretty standard. Uh, we pay the insurance all out at one point, but a portion of it goes throughout the year to the next year. And uh, accounts receivable and accounts payable. So accounts receivable at the top, um, all of that has already been collected in this new fiscal period. So uh, that's good. There's a little bit still, still outstanding uh, from Vernon Canada, but we're working on that. Um, same with accounts payable. Um, that's all been um, dealt with in the last six months or so, so everything has been accounted for. And then moving to the second page of the financials is where I refer to the funding graph that you can see on my screen. Um, and up here, so the main portion of the revenue 
or that some can come through the Saskatchewan Stockers Association, which is actually Environment and Climate Change Canada funding. Uh, it goes through Saskatchewan Stockers, so we like to show it as Saskatchewan Stockers on the financial statements. Obviously, that's the biggest funding source uh, at 46% of the entire revenue from the last year. Second at 19% is Environment Canada again, um, and that's with HSP funding, uh, the Habitat Stewardship Program. Uh, and that's at 19%, followed by Minister of Agriculture with 13%. So if you're looking at this graph in reference to the financial statements to the um, income statement, it's just the percentage, the total um, revenue received is showing on the financial statement for you to reference. After that, it's Environment Canada again uh, for the Green Sage, Sage Growth Program at 10%. So combined, actually, all together, Environment Canada makes up like 68% um, of our total funding. 75% this year, 75% uh, of our total funding come from Environment and Climate Change Canada. So they are definitely a key funder for the operations of SODCAP. I don't want to disregard other funders, those are just the main ones, but we also get funding from um, Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Association, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's. Um, we got some funding last year from Service Canada for some summer students that we hired. Um, so every little bit from anybody helps absolutely to get the programs done, but uh, I just like wanted to highlight the main ones. Always interesting is then where does that money go? So again, if you look at the graph, I find this just gives a nice representation of the majority of the program. So 41% to wages, 24% to project delivery, and 15% to management. The key behind all that, there's a lot of accounts going into all of those categories and we basically can't do the program without having the people on the floor, the people on the field that are getting the, the programs completed. So it makes sense that that's where the majority of our funding is going. Um, project delivery is our agrologists, um, our field consultants, um, wages, we have two full-time employees so that gets managed in there, and our executive director is our management um, who keeps the ball rolling, the whole ball rolling. So those are our largest expenditures. Um, consistently from year to year, those are the largest. Uh, the percentages may vary, but uh, that's the most, most often the largest ones. After that, producer agreement, the actual payments that we make out to the producers uh, that we're working on from year to year are 13%. And then after that, it's a very small window of all of the regular business expenses, accounting, advertising, insurance, um, meeting expenses, office expenses, workshops, that kind of thing that we put on. So hopefully those graphs provide a little bit of a bigger picture on what, what is happening. Like I said, the numbers are, are in front of you in the financial statements. Every year we have the financial statements for um, audited by an independent third party auditor. Um, he is based out of Regina uh, and uh, goes through everything in detail. So give us a little bit of extra reassurance on that. At the end of the year, we ended up actually with a loss we had greater expenses than, than our revenue for 2020. We had um, 
net income or excess revenue in the year before. So it worked out okay for us. We ended up using the extra money from 2019 to get us through 2020. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for 2021. Um, yeah, that's kind of the main stuff that I wanted to talk about. Is there any questions specifically on where anything might be allocated? Is there anything anybody's wondering about? Uh, in 2019, we secured a few more corporate funders than we did in 2020. Uh, that made a difference on our financials. Uh, in 2020, we, we didn't get anything from any of the industry partners. And that uh, does go and reflect in the financials when you look at the compares from 19 to 20. Otherwise, yeah. That's the main point that I wanted to go through. Anybody have any questions? Or Caitlin, did you have any questions from anybody? Don't go um, easy yeah, on there is a, There is a question. Um, just to understand if the listener um, understood correctly, are the management expenses more than the producer agreement? Yes, the producer agreements are based on um, what gets, yeah, <laughs> like yes they are, they show us up, but Tom would know that. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, these are sought caps books, and this, the producer agreements that were paid out uh, are reflected here, and those are the, the monies that flows directly from SOCAP to producers that we're working with. Under the agreements with uh, the SARPEL funding and the National Fiction Wildlife Foundation funding, those monies flow to the Saskatchewan stock growers, and the stock growers make the payments directly to, to the producer. So, uh, and, and so on the stock growers books, you'll see. Very little management costs, but huge producer payment costs. Uh, for example, producer agreements we paid out this last year were in that $80,000 range. Uh, the sketchy stock orders uh, would be somewhere in that $300,000 range, but the stock cap employees did the, did the late work to negotiate those agreements. So it's, it's you know, we, we aim for like a 50% An overhead rate? Yeah. No. Well, Tom probably knows. <laughs> yeah. We've we've done a minimum cost analysis to run the program, and that was. Oh. Sorry. Let's let's repeat the question. Yeah. Sorry. Um. We, we've tried to calculate uh, what it costs for us to run the, the, the core functions of the organization. And that is somewhere in that hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, and our income to support that is way below that. So uh, we use whatever administration money we get, uh, program money, uh, program management money, and, and we just sort of do the best we can. Uh, and our over, like Lauren said, our overhead is really low because we're all sort of working from home. We have no overhead offices. Uh, Allison is really lenient in how much he actually charges for doing all the hard work here. And, and uh, we, we operate on a three street budget. Simple as that. I 
I did, I will clarify too, we, we aren't a registered charity. We are considered just a nonprofit organization. Uh, there is a difference. It's hard to tell the difference a lot of times. Um, we basically can't issue like donation receipts as a registered charity or anything like that. We are just meant to operate um, for the greater good of society. So we do keep a pretty tight, tight ring on things as much as we can. Um, and we have a lot of reporting that we have to do uh, with each project. So there's a lot of reports that Tom has to prepare for every funding source that we get to specify what we've spent of the funds that we have received. So um, unfortunately, a lot of time is spent on that administrative side of that reporting and not a lot of funding gets provided for that side of the reporting. And I, you know, we see that a lot. Um, it's unfortunate that they don't get much uh, recognition on the time and effort that it takes to prepare the reports that they require. So that is something that hopefully will We'll, we'll change a little bit over time, but any other questions? Because oh. Allison, is it possible somehow, and I realize that the financial statement for SOTCAP, but to include somewhere in here the payment that goes out to the stock growers? You know, just looking at this financial statement, it, it looks like it's top heavy on management mm -hmm. and not so much at the grassroots level. I think it would be useful for the organization if you could somehow show this other payment that goes out and that, that puts it into better perspective. Right. So the question the comments uh, was, is it possible to, to show on the financials or show somewhere maybe even in the annual report the payments that are going on through SODCAP, through the stock growers that aren't getting reflected on SODCAP's financials? Um, because they are two very separate entities, it's hard for us uh, to record that detail. Biggest thing, I guess, would be also attending and looking at the stock growers financials and having their um, AGM report as well. We collaborate quite closely with, very closely with stock growers and, and they always have a presence on our board as well. So, um, from the uh, financial statements perspective, not necessarily. It could be something that we can discuss putting in the notes. So the notes to the financial statements are always kind of finer details of what the operations of the, the company is or the uh, organization is. So yeah, that's, that's a good comment. We can look at doing that. There is references to, you know, our major funding sources and your ability to carry on if some of those funding sources don't continue and stuff. So yeah, maybe we can look at providing something like that just as additional information because I agree it is it is a little um, hard to understand right and all, but yeah. Anything? Caitlin, anything from the she's still there? Um, yes, I'm still here. Um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions online. Okay, if there's no further questions, we just need to uh, approve the presentation of the financial statements of the draft, these are the draft financial statements for the March 31st, 2020 fiscal period. So we just need... Jeff, okay. Jeff. Move the adoption of the financial statements, a seconder. Larry, okay. All in favor? Opposed? They are carried at the auditor. The other thing, business item, is uh, we've had quite a few years of using uh, the auditor that we've been using. So we just want to do a new approval for the March 2021 financial statement.
So we received or we obtained four uh, proposals, audit service proposals from um, three organizations from in the thought cap area and uh, our primary year auditor as well. Just trying to give a little bit of choice. So I guess I'll just go through uh, and give the details of the quote. If anybody wants to look at the quote, they can come up and, and see it if they want. Uh, we were provided a quote from EBT Chartered Professional Accountants. They are based out of Swim Current and Medicine Hat. Uh, they quoted us between 6,500 and 7,500 a year with an additional $1,000 fee for the first year audit. And then we requested a quote uh, on our project audit as well. And they quoted between 2,000 and 5,000 for project audit. I'm just presenting these alphabetically. MFP out of Footprint as well provided a quote. They provided it for $6,000 uh, plus a $300 fee for disbursement plus tax. And that was just a full quote for everything. They are out of the current as well, the MP. And then our current auditor, RDS Chartered Professional Accountants, Robert Sautner, he provided a quote for next year of $4,500 plus tax. And then Stark and Mark, sorry, and Robert is out of Virginia. And Stark and Marsh provided, and they are on a foot current showing in the Sinaboya in this area. And they provided a quote of $7,250 to $7,750. And a long time set up fee between $750 and $1,000. So, sorry, $7,250 to $7,750. So, I'm not sure how many guys want to decide this, I can repeat. It's not my decision. Right. Yes, there, I, I do have. Go ahead. We're I, I know people from all of these firms and I dealt with Robert as well. So, I have no with anybody. I, have, I don't have any preference to anything, so um, and I prefer not to give any direction just because I do the finance. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but there's a problem in the box. Larry? concerns about the present auditor? Does he do a good job? Yeah, he's. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forget. Um, yes, I I haven't had any problems with Robert. Um, I don't know much about him or the other services that he provides. Um, he asks me lots of good questions, I think, and, and, um, and is always easy to deal with. Um, his quote has come in the lowest. Uh, I, if I could say anything, it's probably simply because he is an independent auditor, probably. Um, sole provider auditor, I guess, might be a better question. Okay. Don. I would move that, uh, given the quote, that we understand the quotes, that, that we, we would retain our present auditor. Okay. Don moves that we re retain our present auditor. Don moves that we retain the current honor. Is there a second? Larry, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's Carrie, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's Larry, you can uh, get one call for the second call for any resolutions. Sit in the chair so we can talk For those on the uh, airwaves, my name is Larry Grant. I am now calling for second call for resolutions. Thank you. 
Um, are we ready for the uh, vote? Uh, who is going to be the uh, conservation rep? We are. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Gord Badlin won the, the election for the SODCAP Board of Directors. Uh, I guess the next order of business would be to ask for a motion to destroy the ballots. Larry had moved that we uh, a motion to destroy the ballots. A seconder. Yeah, thank you. All in favor? Good, thank you. All right, I uh, declare the elections closed for this year. Thanks, folks. Sorry, I missed who uh, won. Gord? Okay, there's acoustics in here. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Jeff. I appreciate uh, you. Uh, getting us through this and uh, uh, thank you very much for the job well done. And before Thanks, I Lord. Thanks everybody else. Yes, thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, uh, I, might, I must add that Alice has been terrific to work with uh, in the accounting end of things, financials, very prompt, very efficient, very knowledgeable and uh, very helpful. So thank you very much. Third call for resolutions. This is third and final call for resolutions. If uh, anybody has any, please bring them forward at this time. Don't see any. It doesn't look like there's any resolutions coming forward. So that will be it. Good. Thanks, Larry. Uh, any other business? Anything somebody wants to uh, mention? Yeah, a half hour. No, get out here as quick as you can. Anybody uh, virtual that wants to raise something that's easy to answer? I don't see any comments written in here. Sorry, I missed that. There's no comments written in here. Okay, well, uh, Caitlin, thank you for uh, keeping the electronic end of things going. And uh, first time we've done this, it may not be the uh, last time, who knows, but uh, thank you very much for your help and for everybody who joined us online. So if there's no other business, would somebody move that we adjourn the meeting? Mr. Chairman, before that, could I just offer a, a note of thank you to Tom and all his staff and to yourself as chairman and to the board uh, for keeping this very important organization running. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And that continues, Chris. Well, if uh, somebody moves that we adjourn, uh, Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, if the board could hang by, uh, around here for a few minutes, we'd just like to uh, get together probably 10 minutes at the most. And that would include our new board members like Dale and uh, Clint and uh, Gord is in PA. Uh, and stay, yeah, okay. So if you guys want to just hang up, come up to the front here, and the rest of you, thank you very much for your your time. Thank you.
Hey, Krista, can you hear me? Hi, Kaylin, can you see me? Um, I can't yet. Oh, there you are. Okay, perfect. Um, did you want me to end the webinar now? Um, I think Gord is still on the line. I don't know if you want him to call in another line. Sure. And I'm not sure okay. if you, I'm not sure, do you still, do you guys still need me um, or, um, or what? Yeah, we typically have a, a short board call or meeting right after the, the AGM. Okay. All right. Um, happy to stay on the line or happy to quickly call in up to another number, whatever is preferable. Why don't we send you a number, Gord? Okay. Will that work? Yeah, that, that'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I will exit the webinar and end it for everyone, and then Gord will call you guys and you have your board meeting. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks. Thank you. Does that sound good, Krista? Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.